Here we go. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to examine the scientific approach to trading and to market analysis and to technical analysis. With me is David Aronson. David is the author of this classic book called Evidence-Based Technical Analysis, and he's also the author of another new book called Statistically Sound Machine Learning for Algorithmic Trading of Financial Instruments. David is a former adjunct professor at Baruch College School of Business in New York. He's also a former proprietary trader with Spear, Leeds, and Kellogg, one of the largest trading firms in the country. Now, as I understand, it's part of Goldman Sachs. Welcome, David. And, and of course, another problem uh, that affects researchers is uh, they have a vested interest in a particular cherished outcome. If, if you're an economist or a business school researcher looking into trading systems, it's a, a feather in your cap if you come up with a, a new trading system that uh, looks statistically significant in your research. So there are, I suppose one might say, subtle emotional pressures to uh, get your experiment to come out. Uh, one way or another. Oh, sure. That's that's definitely there. I mean, it may be that your job depends upon coming up with something good. So it's very difficult to avoid all of these different biases, and, and it's especially difficult in financial market data because the the patterns, the real patterns that are there, are quite weak in relation to background noise. Uh, there is a very low level of predictability, and the patterns tend to be complicated. So when you combine the fact that you've got a lot of noise and a very complicated pattern, it's very difficult to get tease that pattern out of the background and say, mm -hmm. right, we've really found something. Yeah. I think it's worth pointing out that this is not a problem unique to uh, research on the financial markets. It's uh, very controversial in mainstream fields like medicine. Yeah, I, I think I think it's more pronounced in technical analysis simply because the effects are so much smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it, it's present in in any field, particularly now where a lot of science is moving towards the the empirical data approach, um, and people are scanning through large databases to to look for effects. Uh, there was recently an item in the news that something that was thought to be good for you, fish oil, somebody came up with the fact that it may not be good for you. And it became a very controversial finding and it appears as if that finding was the result of dredging through a lot of retrospective studies. Now I've been following the fish oil controversy as a, as a matter of fact because I take fish oil and it's fascinating. They said, oh yeah, it's great for your heart, but if, if you take too much fish oil it can cause cancer. Now well, the most recent finding I read is that, oh well, the database that they used to uh, come up with the conclusion that it might lead to cancer is uh, a tainted database. The database itself is now being called into question. So I, I imagine this exactly is it frustrates a lot of people who try to follow science is, is that it's almost infinitely complex and you have to dig and dig and dig and dig before you uh, can feel comfortable with uh, results in different areas. Yeah, and this, this is true throughout science. I think the debate raged on for over 150 years about whether fuzzy objects in the sky were existing within our own galaxy or whether they represented galaxies, separate galaxies far, far away. Ultimately, it was, it was resolved in, in favor of that, but uh, for, for many, many years, there were good scientists on both sides of that question. No. And uh, I mean, you worked as a proprietary trader, so I'm sure you know that when when you're there dealing day to day uh, and with responsibility for managing accounts, it's not so much science that you're going to rely on, but various heuristic shortcuts, mental shortcuts that help you to act quickly and make decisions at the spur of the moment based on uh, your best assessment at the time. Well, I. I was trading on a purely subjective basis at that time. I did not have uh, the resources to develop a trading system. So that's, and that was what the management wanted and uh, that's what I did. And it was, 
okay for a while, and then after a while, it was not so good. So it turned out to be kind of a, a net, no gain, no loss after yeah. uh, about six years. Well, I guess and that's what really. Go ahead. I'm I'm sorry. I was just going to say that that's what got me thinking about taking a more scientific a, approach to the field. And obviously, you know, a, a lot of people feel that way. I know traders who, who believe that computers will never be able to uh, deal with the complexities uh, of the markets the way the human mind can. But there seems to be a trend uh, more and more towards algorithmic trading. Well, the, there's a large body of research in the field of psychology that the human mind is not particularly adept at the type of complexity that you run into in financial markets, a so-called consideration of multiple variables at the same time. There are many studies uh, that compare the judgment and intuition of experts uh, against simple statistical models and in general the winner is this statistical model. Yeah, I, I know that line of research began back in the, as I recall, in the 1950s by uh, Paul Meal. I think he was at the University of Minnesota. Uh, it continued for many, many decades. Hundreds of studies seem to show that uh, uh, intuition, uh, professional intuition by doctors, psychologists, uh, other highly trained people is not as good as those professionals themselves think it is. It's a good example of the overconfidence bias, mm -hmm. which is which is known amongst traders. Uh, on the uh, other, it's on known the other almost hand, everywhere. Th there are lines of research uh, that have developed recently that show that the human brain is capable of uh, performing uh, sophisticated, not just the human brain, even a baboon brain can perform sophisticated mathematical ca calculations of which the conscious mind would be unaware. Yeah, the, uh, you're referring to implicit learning. Um, yeah, that's, that apparently does go on. It certainly goes on in, in the field of music and uh, perhaps even in markets. There are talented traders who do very well and they can't really even explain how they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but because they can't explain how they do it, when they run into a cold spell, they can't explain why they're cold either. Yeah. So it's... Um, but there are certainly people who can just look at market data and, and perceive patterns the average person can. Yeah. I, I know that that's the case, and I know traders who seem to be consistently successful week after week, month after month, year after year, and uh, I've attempted to interview them and find out, you know, can would it be possible to take their method and, and put it into a decision tree or into an expert computer system? and. Uh, they tell me in principle it ought to be, but they're never able to explain it. It's just that, that, that feel. They have the feel. Yeah. So, uh, of course, you see the same thing in uh, lots of uh, areas of human performance. Great, great artists, uh, musicians, uh, even great scientists. I think Einstein himself wrote very eloquently about the need to appreciate the intuitive side of human nature. Yep. So uh, I, I'm a big believer in the intuitive side of, of human nature, David. I uh, served for many years as president of a nonprofit organization called the Intuition Network, and I'm still actively involved in it. But I tend to think that uh, intuition functions best when, when it's informed by science. So it's a, a mixture of, of good good fact and then letting the brain do its mm -hmm. thing with that. Uh, there's a, a, a book called Educating Intuition by, I have it, um, it, was, it was quite interesting and he talks about those situations that are, that are very good for intuitive kinds of capabilities and those that aren't, aren't as good. Yeah. Well, I know with regard to trading, you've got some traders who prefer an intuitive style. You've got some who are really leaning towards getting themselves out of the equation as much as possible, which is one of the great advantages of algorithmic trading. And uh, you've uh, 
your work is definitely leans in the direction of algorithmic trading, particularly your newest book, because that's what it's all about. Let's let's talk about some of the uh, particular scientific statistical issues that come up in the development of trading algorithms. I think the big one is a problem that uh, we gearheads or geeks call overfitting that when you have a very uh, powerful modeling method, uh, and by powerful I mean it's capable of uh, fitting very nonlinear phenomena, very uh, complicated patterns. When you have a modeling method like that, and you have a problem where the authentic patterns, if they are in existence, are quite weak relative to the amount of randomness in the background, you can get into a situation where the modeling method can't tell the difference between the noise and the background and it starts fitting the noise and obviously a model based upon noise is not going to do well when you're using it in the future. So that's, that is a very big problem, overfitting. Mm. And the, the more intelligent or better conceived um, machine learning or data mining algorithms, these, these approaches for generating trading systems, try to distinguish between what's real and what's not real. And they have, they have various methods for doing that. To, in my experience, it, it would seem the major way to eliminate uh, that problem of overfitting is, is to make sure that when you're training a system and testing a system, you're using lots and lots of data, many years worth of data, preferably, rather than, say, a few months. Well, that can help, but it still doesn't protect you because if you give the machine enough liberty, it'll wind up fitting noise in big samples of data. Yeah. Uh, so it's helpful, but and it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And the the, the better conceived algorithms go through various um, steps where they penalize themselves for making the model too complicated because a complicated model is more likely to. Uh, fall into this overfitting trap. The, the or, more variables you have, the more, in effect, degrees of freedom you have to to get your your model to uh, overfit. The, the the complexity can come out in two ways. One is the number of variables, as you point out. The other one is with, with these newer modeling methods that are not constrained to have linear surfaces or or some other well-behaved um, shape fit the data. Um, they can overfit the data even with a very small number of variables just by uh, making the model's uh, response surface be take on many, many different curves and jumps and fit every nook and cranny that's existing in the data. Mm -hmm. So that's an, another problem. And the, the way that the philosophy that, that I've um, been in favor of is to use something, a technique called cross-validation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, during the cross-validation process, the data is broken up into many separate chunks. And some of the chunks are used for training or fitting the model. And a reserve chunk is used to see how good that model is. And this process happens many, many, many times. And when you uh, get the model, when the model starts to move into the, a state of being overfit, its performance will degrade on those reserved chunks of data. And that's the signal that the model has become too complicated for the actual pattern that's in the data. Would, do you feel that cross-validation by itself is, is adequate to ensure against overfitting? Nothing can ensure against overfitting, unfortunately, but it can certainly mitigate the problem a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it's, it's often that done that the data is divided up into 10 chunks and 9 chunks are used for training the model and then a 10th chunk is used for checking the model based on those 9 chunks and then they develop, you develop the model on a different 9 chunks and check it on a different 10th chunk and this goes on and on and on and it does give a pretty good real in indication when the model has taken on too many variables or, or has become too wavy, mm -hmm. too nonlinear. 